Good afternoon, Kent. Thank you for joining us here. My name is Nikki Lunsford, and I'm with the Middletown uh, research team out of Ball State. And we're looking at the social service agencies that benefit our communities and the impact that they're giving, as well as the changes they've seen over time. So as the Executive Officer of East Central Indiana Goodwill, did I get it right? Close. Okay, help so, me out. President and CEO of Goodwill of Central and Southern Indiana. Okay, so Mr. Kent Kramer has agreed to sit with me and talk today a little bit about the impact and, and what Goodwill's um, goals and, and what they do for our community above giving us great place to, for, for good finds. Mm -hmm. I love to get all my kids big wheels at Goodwill. <laughs> So first, Kent, oh, I also need to say that we're at the new Excel Center in Muncie, Indiana. Yes. On Jackson Street, and this is sponsored by Goodwill, and it's in its first year, going to have its second graduation in June, yes. I think, which is very exciting. I can't wait until we get into that. For starters, I want to know your background your life story, and what brought you to the position you now occupy, your passions, that travel system. Yeah, yeah. So, well, thank you. I, uh, I grew up in Muncie, uh, Indiana, and um, spent my first 18 years uh, here and, and went through the uh, public school system, a, a 1985 graduate of Muncie Central. Um, <clears throat> and then I went on to Indiana State, uh, from there and uh, really had a wonderful five years uh, at <laughs> Indiana State. Um, but when I was in Muncie, growing up as a child, my grandfather had grocery stores in Muncie Ooh. and they were uh, uh, White's supermarkets. And unfortunately he sold those be before I became of working age. Um, but uh, some of his folks that worked with him went to a uh, grocery that's no longer around, but it was called Wise's, mm -hmm. um, Wise's Grocery. Mm -hmm. And I ended up getting a job and working uh, three years of high school at okay. Wise's, and I just loved it. So I knew I really enjoyed, I got that bug from him. I enjoyed uh, retail and commerce and customer service and all that. So going through Indiana State, I knew when I got out that I wanted to find a job like that, that I really enjoyed. And that's where I landed at uh, Sam's Club. It's hmm. the first place I worked um, getting out of college and I was a trainee in Springfield, Missouri. And I spent 11 years with Sam's Club, uh, made eight moves and just My. loved every minute of it except for all the moves. The moves. Um, uh, so it was a trainee, then assistant manager, um, store manager, um, district manager, regional manager. So um, it was at a time when they were growing rapidly and if you were willing to move and uh, you understood the business and took mm -hmm. care of people, then you could advance. Yes. So ended up in uh, um, New Jersey, Pennsylvania as a regional manager over those, uh, all of New Jersey and part of um, Pennsylvania. And uh, we had our first child in DC, our second child in New Jersey. We wanted to have more ch children. So <laughs> my wife said, we got to figure, you, you know, this is hard without a support system. So yes. we moved back to Indiana and uh, um, that was year 2000 and we've been, been here since. Um, but uh, along the way, I, I got a job here um, leading 20 Kmarts in um, central oh. and northern Indiana. So I spent two years and that was a blast coming back to Muncie because at the time there were two Kmarts in Muncie. Yes. So I supervised those along with 18 mm -hmm. others. But Kmart was going through a tough time, yes. bankruptcy, and yes. ended up closing um, a lot of those stores. All of them are All closed them here. now mm -hmm. here. Um, but a recruiter found me for Goodwill, and they said they were looking for a VP of retail. Uh, and they wanted to expand oh. the retail reach they had uh, mm -hmm. in their territory, and uh, um, I was a fit. So that was mm -hmm. 2002. Okay. And, uh, you know, kind of. Uh, it's been wonderful. So I spent 10 years as the VP of retail, um, still love retail, but fell in love with the mission of Goodwill, of helping people. 
and um, you know, w went on and got my MBA at Anderson University, went through an executive development program mm -hmm. with Goodwill International, so that, you know, all these are steps to become uh, a CEO, so that was my dream. There's 160 Goodwills across North America. My ultimate dream was to be the CEO in Indiana, but just didn't know if that would happen, but oh, it did happen, and that's what I've been doing for four years. Interesting. You say there's 160 Goodwills across <clears throat> the nation. Yes. Goodwill. Do you mean Goodwill stores? No. Because there's a lot more than that. Correct. There, yes. Um, there's around 3,000 Goodwill stores. In different hierarchies, yes. I'm not sure. Yes. But don't go so there yet. Go into the 160. So um, Goodwill is geographically bound, each territory, and we govern by our own uh, board of directors. Ours is based in Indianapolis, okay. and there's 39 counties that we operate uh, within central and southern oh. Indiana. So oh. that was uh, developed way back, if, if I can go into how yes, this all happened. Do. So 1902 in yes. Boston, uh, the Reverend Edgar Helms was a Methodist minister, and part of the mission of his church was to go out into the suburbs of Boston, which was like a mile away, but go out into the suburbs of Boston, collect uh, household goods, clothing, bring it back to the basement of his church, and and um, he would pay people to uh, repair and fix things and get mm -hmm. it, and then he would give it away, um, primarily to um, uh, poor immigrants that were living around his church. That gives me goosebumps. I know. What a great idea. But one lady raised her hand and said, um, I don't want you to give this to me. I'd rather earn it somehow. So there that clicked into the, you know, the hand up versus a hand out, oh um, you know, chance, not charity. And Teaching the fish, don't yes, give them the fish. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that started, um, again, 1902, that started Goodwill. And uh, uh, Reverend Helm spent the next several decades going out and planting Goodwills really um across north america and then ultimately um, it's in the, in the, you know kind of worldwide now but so in north america there's 160 of these kind of planted pocket goodwill uh, pocket goodwill so the money raised in that community stays in that community is kind of the way it works so that that goes Do back to how there's 160 all right so in indiana there's a south bend based one a fort wayne indianapolis Terre Haute and Evansville. Those are the, the Goodwills five. Five for, in Indiana. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So how do you keep consistency among all of those 160 individual mm -hmm. fran franchises, but not franchises? Right. Yeah. It's it's uh, it's what's called a federated model. So it's it's really tough to do that. Um, ultimately, we have membership standards that we we follow that through Goodwill International. Mm -hmm. But it's basically, um, you know, are you serving people? Are you providing people opportunities? Um, you know, um, there's some data to follow and all that, but it's the consistency is different. So if you go into a store in Fort Wayne, it might look a little different than Muncie. But all of our 74 stores that we have in central and southern Indiana uh, do look the same, have the same pricing, same philosophy, same training. Um, so it's just, it is a little different. Um, when you go across mm -hmm. them. I think that I heard once that you have three, four, five different stratas of Goodwill stores. Like you have a vintage, vintage boutique and an outlet and then the normal Goodwill that yeah. most of us know. Correct. Explain that a little bit. Yeah. So um, the Goodwill that most of us know has been around. Uh, so the Reverend Helms came through Indiana in 1930, and that's really? when he planted in a Methodist church on the south side of Indianapolis. Oh my! And that's what we're, we were birthed out of that. Huh. Um, so we've had the regular stores, and you know, um, mm -hmm. advancements and, and things have happened over the years. But we have the regular stores. But um, in 2005, we went out to Portland, Oregon, and discovered this model called the Outlet Store. And the Outlet Store is we have four of those now. Um, and uh, getting ready to open one in Clarksville in, in southern Indiana oh. um, later this year. We have four of them. Does that mean Indiana? In, Indiana, yeah. Interesting, okay. The closest one to here would be the east side of Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. But what, what the outlet store is, so um, when an individual donates to a regular store mm -hmm. and then we put it out for sale, we leave it out for four weeks, we have a pretty steep discounting um, process, 
if something doesn't sell, we need to make room for new stuff because mm-hmm. that's what people like when they come to mm-hmm. Goodwill. Is they like the treasure hunt. They like to mm-hmm. find things. And if they see the same stuff, mm-hmm. it's not the experience that they expect. So we're always rotating goods through. Well, the outlet gives those goods that didn't make the sale or maybe didn't make the quality to go on a Mm -hmm. floor gives them one more chance to sell um, before we would recycle it or salvage it and and for a small portion you know um, put it in the trash so Mm -hmm. the outlets provide that opportunity everything sold by the pound it's bulk Um, it's a crazy shopping experience (laughs) I love it because there's so much activity but people stay in there all day and Hmm. they shop they look for you find people that all I'm looking for are blue jeans and they just they dig through the bins and and buy blue blue jeans some people look for board games and they piece together board games and sell it online we figure about 80% of the transactions done in an outlet is there's further commerce going to happen afterwards whether it's a flea market online. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's the outlet. We also have Vintage Vogue, which we have three of those, and uh, one in Bloomington, one in um, Broad Ripple Broad area, Ripple. and then one um, um, uh, down off of Virginia um, in um, um, Fountain Indianapolis, Square? Fountain Square Fountain area. Square. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So those are, um, we take we take the um, kind of high-end labels and vintage mm-hmm. items and we mm-hmm. sort through excess donations and put those in that store. So we do a little bit of the searching and, and uh, selecting for people. And those yeah. are a lot of fun too. Yeah. Um, and then we also, a fourth uh, one is online. We, about 10% of our um, operations is done online. Hmm. We've got a 62,000 square foot facility on the northwest side of Indianapolis, uh, 120 people employed there, and they um, we sell on eBay. We sell on a, uh, our own site, which is which is housed out of um, Orange County, California, mm-hmm. uh, called ShopGoodwill.com, hmm. and we sell on uh, several other sites. But uh, those are if somebody you know, donates us, let's say a yard row vase, we might be able to get five dollars and ninety nine cents at a store. But we might be able to get a hundred and five dollars, right, or, more. or online, right. and that so that delta there, we are able to sink back into the mission of the organization. So we try to do our best, whatever the donation is, to get the most value out of it because that's invested right back into the uh, the mission of the organization. So lots of platforms for retail. Mm-hmm. Amazing, amazing. But um, you haven't stayed with just retail we have it goodwill has branched out absolutely so um before we go there maybe i should talk about the clients in your stores Mm -hmm. how have you seen that change so you've been with this with goodwill now for 17 years is that what my Mm -hmm. my aunt said so how is that how's over those 17 plus years you were in sam's clubs before that's also kind of a a discount kind Mm -hmm. of shopper How, how have you seen the clients change over that time period? Yeah. So, um, you know, we, we've got right around 4,100 employees in our organization. So it's kind of a large, complex organization. 2,800 of those uh, are in retail. Mm. Um, and when you look at the, our employees and those that we serve within our own ranks and have provided job and job training, um, the 2,800, two thirds have a barrier to employment. And we define that as an individual that has a, um, maybe they lack a high school diploma. Yes. Maybe they have a disability of um, some sort, or they might have uh, a criminal background, or it might be, you know, two or three of those. It just right. kind of depends. So we we work really well with people that have barriers, and lots of times these are people that are not afforded an opportunity outside of what we're able um, to provide. So what has changed um, over the years? Um, is the the number of people that lack a high school diploma. Um, really? Um, actually, any one of those barriers uh, seems to have increased because as mm. it becomes more and more competitive to find employment, a lot of the jobs where people without a high school diploma may have worked, um, you know, 20 years ago, those jobs are not around anymore. So a lot of the, the factory and the manufacturing um, right. type jobs were... What, 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 we're, what we're seeing and what the state uh, chamber says in, a, in, a, in an article released um, 
last year, you know, of the million jobs that the state's going to need to ha be filled in um, uh, in the next 10 years, 65% of those are jobs that require high school plus uh, additional certification and credential. So uh, for us, it used to be about let's just get somebody a job and get them some job training so that they can go off and find another job. What we're finding is that we've got to we've got to provide more than just that. Interesting. So, so you haven't seen the difference in clients, but in, in employees. Right. Amazing. You never thought of that. Yeah. So, you branched off because of that need. Is that what caused you then to branch off into some of your other endeavors? Yes. Yes. So, um, you know, with our employee base plus those that we served so we used to run unemployment uh, offices and what we saw coming through those was um, actually in Indianapolis in one office we would see um, a half a million uh, people a year half of those uh, did not ha or I'm sorry 50,000 and half of those 25,000 did not have a high school diploma so placing those folks into jobs was nearly impossible and if we did it was short lived it was a low in you know mm -hmm. a low wage low skilled job we'd see them back in 3 months and it was just a cycle of serving the same people and not having a lot of solutions for them so that's when we decided you know what let's try and let's try and head this off and we opened our first high school a charter high school uh, and this was traditional age kids this was back in um, um, 2004 we still operate that high school today 15 years later it's called the Indianapolis Met I've been there um, but what we well good mm -hmm. um, what we found serving them is that a lot of them their their, their parents didn't have a high school diploma right. if it's they got so to cool. the age of 18 or 19 it's like you know I'm not gonna get done so they would drop out um, so what we what we discovered then is like you know there's not a lot of options there's a GED but that's mm -hmm. not for everybody right. um, um, and in some areas you know have limited coverage on that so what we found is what if what would happen if we created a high school for adults and that's what we did and this um, this was back in 2010 um, so not too long ago so 2010 mm -hmm. we opened that first um, high school um, and we thought we would have 300 seats. Well, six months into it, we had 2,000 on the wait list. Oh, my land. So we have been opening these Excel centers uh, across the state um, since 2010. We have 14 now that we operate, and then we've licensed the model outside of our territory, the 160 outside of our territory. There are now six other Goodwills that, that license the model um, from us. So there's 14 that we operate in Indiana, and then the South Bend Goodwill operates three, one in Gary, one in Hammond, and one in South Bend. Um, in the state of Indiana, there are nearly a half a million Hoosiers, working age Hoosiers, that do not have a high school diploma, and they are getting left behind. Yes. And this is a, a, an opportunity um, to serve those students. So. Wow. Um, we've learned a lot along the yes. way. And if I'm not badly yeah. mistaken, they don't get a GED. They get an official they do. high school yeah. diploma. Yeah. And in most of your centers, you have child care. We do. All so of them. So that they can leave their babies in safe yeah. care yeah. and truly learn. Yeah. So that's, there's some model elements. One is a child, free child care. Um, about half of our students have kids of their own. Many mm -hmm. of them you know, toddler age where they need somebody to watch, and that's been a barrier. They might have gotten mm -hmm. pregnant in high school, they might have gotten, yeah. um, um, you know, might have dropped out and then got pregnant, and then just, you know, a pathway to education is nearly impossible yes. um, just because of the affordability of childcare. So that's free. We give everybody free transportation. So on a bus line or we carpool, we figure things out how to get them there. So we try hard to knock that barrier down. Uh, accelerated pace. If you are in your 20s and 30s, say, I'm going to go back to high school. You want it to be quick. Yeah. Um, you know, so <laughs> it's, it's an accelerator. You're ready to do We it. don't have a lot of downtime. You know, it's mm -hmm. eight, um, I'm sorry, five eight-week terms. So they're, oh, okay. they find success quickly and they just keep going. Um, everybody gets a life coach. So mm -hmm. a lot of the barriers or struggles that you had 10 years ago might still be in your life. 
And a life coach can help you do that. I did and, not know you had that. What yeah. are the qualifications to be a life coach? So it, it, um, life coaches come to us a variety of ways. It could be uh, a social work background. It could be uh, just working with that population um, type um, background. So, um, but um, these are individuals that receive um, credit training um, so that they can provide credit. They learn all the resources of a community. What do you so, mean credit training? So um, um, just um, financial literacy um, training, right? Because it's it's that may be a barrier to a job. You get through the Excel Center, but it, you know if if you are near bankruptcy, right? Um, they help you get work through all that. So our job is to help people prepare for what's next and uh, education is just a piece of it. This life coach can help on a lot of things, housing, childcare post the Excel Center, um, you know, uh, credit literacy, a, a lot of different things that they, they help with. So about half their time is spent on like school stuff, making sure mm -hmm. that you've got the right classes and you're mm -hmm. on a good path. and and you're showing up, and if not, they're calling you. The other half is, is helping you find success, you know, in the new world that's going to be. Okay, that just, is, that just yeah. amazes me. So what about, um, let's just go on into the Nurse Family Partnership, because that's here in Muncie also. Yeah, yeah. We've had that maybe four years? Yes, yeah, yeah. Tell me about, tell us about that. Yes. <laughs> and, and I'm loving the noise in the background. Yeah. I just put that on the yeah. camera because we're beginning to change. We're at the Excel Center, we as are. I mentioned first. And so we're hearing the change of children coming in and out as yeah. their parents are learning to be productive citizens. Yes. So with that caveat, let's go ahead and talk about the Nurse Family Partnership. Yeah. So Nurse Family Partnership is a home visitation program for low-income first-time moms. So this is a... Um, a national program mm -hmm. that has been around for 40 plus years. It's what's called an evidence-based program. So there's mm -hmm. been randomized controlled trials done uh, at various stages uh, during that um, 40 years. And why that's important is it's it, it makes it easier to get funding for mm -hmm. that because sure. a community, a state, uh, philanthropists know that what they're supporting actually works. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've found as well. So we've done that since 2011 and uh, we came to this area about four years ago. Mm -hmm. And basically what that does, it serves, there are 14,000, so this just 14,000 um, first time Medicaid eligible mothers, um, uh, expectant mothers in the state every year. And what that means is the state pays for those births, right? These are um, these yes. are families in poverty. Yes. Uh, lots of times they're single, um, um, single moms, and it's their first baby. So what 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 Nurse Family Partnership does is uh, pairs a registered nurse, which is a Goodwill employee, pairs a registered nurse with that family, mm -hmm. and it's in the first trimester of pregnancy, and that nurse and that mom will have a relationship for the next two and a half years. She will visit uh, between 50 and 55 times in that two and a half year period and form this bond that's incredible. And uh, not only does the nurse provide, you know, kind of the health aspects, you know, checking the, you know, the progress of the uh, pregnancy, prenatal vitamins, you know, eating, uh, all those things, but also provides, um, kind of this coaching concept of, mm -hmm. you know, how are you going to care for that baby? Right. And, you know, uh, you dropped out of high school. Can we get you in to the Excel Center? Right. Can we get you into a high school? Right. Um, so there's tough love, but there's also mm -hmm. a lot of coaching and wonderful mm -hmm. bonding. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, many times that that mom doesn't have that person that can help them. There's right? a lot there, of isolation in there There is population. isolation. They're out on their own. Uh, they've quit things before, yes. and it's just you just find yourself really, uh, you know, sometimes the partner's gone. Um, so it's just a really difficult uh, time for yes. that. Um, but the outcomes are incredible. The outcomes are mm -hmm. um, if, if you think you can prevent one NICU baby from happening, the mm -hmm. savings there alone, right. um, you know. Because this nurse brings books in, talks about the importance of vocabulary and reading, 
um, mm -hmm. the amount of need for remediation at kindergarten is right. cut in half. Right. Just with this two and a half year engagement, mm -hmm. you're talking two and a half years later, yes. it's cut in half, right. even though there's been no interaction. Mm -hmm. At the age of 15, it's almost cut in half. I think 47%, by the time that child turns 15, 47% less likely that they're gonna be involved in the criminal justice system mm -hmm. by that mm -hmm. age. So it's just incredible. It is. And it's that coaching and counseling during that first two and a half years. It changes the trajectory because the mom's been a mom the way she was mommed and obviously that didn't work very well. Right. So we're going to change that and give them a different, right. I just think they just yeah. another goosebump thing. Yeah. So there may be other fingers that you do that I don't know about. So I want you to bring those up if they come to you, but let's go into the key goals of your organization. Listening to you, I'm hearing that somebody has the vision to fix rather than just exist right. what are the key goals yeah so um ultimately we're about changing lives and empowering people to increase their independence and reach their potential that's that's it changing lives through empowerment and increasing um, independence and helping people reach their potential and you have mentioned it's done through employment, education, and health. Those are mm -hmm. kind of our three prongs um, that we look at. Um, so ultimately, and everybody comes to us with different needs. Yes. So if you are a, we have a division called Disability Services. If you are somebody that comes in, and let's just say you've got Down syndrome, mm -hmm. and you're, uh, you know, reaching your potential is getting a part-time job mm -hmm. at the local grocery store or at the local Goodwill store. We will work hard with that person, with that family, and serve them so that they can become successful in that part-time job. Now, would that be self-sustaining? Probably not. Um, but many of the people that we work with outside of that population, it's all about how can we get them connected with a family-sustaining wage? You know, some type of job, and sometimes it's multiple steps. Mm -hmm. It might be getting a job at a Goodwill store as kind of a, a transitional employee just to get you through, get you some job experience. But while we have you there, we have a program called Goodwill Guides that will connect with that person and help them set goals and, and find education. They might have their high school diploma, but that's all they have. And let's say they want to be a welder or a certified nursing assistant, a certified medical assistant, or they want to get into logistics. We will help create the pathway so that they can find that and, and, and be successful. So ultimately, anybody we touch, whether it's our 4,100 employees or it's our, you know, um, right around 2,500 people that we serve outside of that, it's connecting them with the opportunity that's going to help them find success. So that's, you know, very high level. Uh, yeah, there's it's... lots, as you say, prongs on how we... Yeah. How we get there I mean we have a recidivism program called new beginnings where people have been incarcerated mm -hmm. we wrap intensive services around them um, for how a do, six month program how do they get to you how do um, believe it or not it's uh, word of mouth and parole officers they know oh, it works I see. so the the unfortunately the recidivism rate in Indiana which means when you get out three years later, who's back in right. is right around 37 percent. In Marion right. County in Indianapolis, it's it's almost 50 percent. So almost one in two are back in. They've reoffended and they're back in. If is you this, can link them with a job right. and training and soft skills, our recidivism rate for people that go through that program is under five percent. Oh my gosh, that's wonderful. Is this just adults or is this youth yeah, also? This is just adults. But we serve a lot of youth, um, provide employment opportunities and coaching mm -hmm. opportunities for youth, too, that have gone through the system. Ha Over time, has that number changed? The number of people we help, it has. It has. And it's just because we, we see that as a significant barrier. Okay. It just it is. Um, the Department of uh, Corrections did a, uh, um, a survey two years ago and just asked um, uh, employers, a large group of employers, who would give, if somebody came to you and said they had a felony, would you hire them? 71% said no. Yeah. So that's what they're up against. Mm -hmm. um, and some, it might make sense, right? If you're a bank right. and, and that type right. of thing. Um, but for many, um, they rely on us. We, we can go to somebody and say, 
they've been in this intensive program for six months. We've worked with them. Um, they're now showing up to work. They understand this. They've got stable housing. They've got their transportation figured out. They have a mentor they work with. They've got all of these resources. Supports. Supports. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's one thing that, that's really changed over the years is, you know, we used to provide jobs. And um, um, now we look at it more holistically. So, yeah, let's get them a job. But what else do they need to find success? Because lots of times... Um, there's a lot going on with mm -hmm. that individual and mm -hmm. uh, to provide additional supports and kind of understand where they're at. Um, that's where the, the change has been to, to serve people more holistically mm -hmm. and um, follow them after job placement so that we can kind of measure that success. Mm -hmm. What do you think the root causes are of this change and those challenges with more people um, being uneducated, mm -hmm. more people having more barriers. Is it because we know about them or is it because there's more people? What are the root causes? Yeah. So the, I, I look at that in a couple of ways. One, um, generational poverty is mm -hmm. one that absolutely, uh, if you are born into poverty, it is hard to claw your yes. way out. And because you have limited resources, um, both in knowledge and just in actual resources. So getting a solid education sometimes in if, if your family's in poverty sometimes I mean we hear this from a lot of our students we've got 4100 um, students in our Excel centers right now and we hear this from them they had to drop out because somebody got sick and they had mm -hmm. to care for their family right rarely mm -hmm. is it I just failed I just mm -hmm. I couldn't make high school work so we find mm -hmm. some really incredible really mm -hmm. intelligent people it's like yes. really you're 35 mm -hmm. and you dropped out and you're just breezing yes. through right. that, that's what we find mm -hmm. um, so generational poverty uh, is huge and then the, you know this lack of an education right. is also significant so um, we serve people that um, yeah. it's just it's becoming more and more difficult even with a high school diploma to find a job that's going to take care of your family you've got to get some additional education and that's what we really try and work with people so that mm -hmm. they can find that we talk a lot about the asset Alice families, asset mm -hmm. limited, income constrained, employed. That is that the margin area that you're working it in? It is, yeah, absolutely. And that's grown. It, yes, it has. Yeah, you know, um, I would say I was going to say, in 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 kind of the non-urban, like you know, um, but we're seeing it everywhere. We're yeah. we're seeing it right. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the the gap between um, the wealthy and the poor is getting wider. Mm -hmm. The middle class is sliding to um, the lower class, and mm -hmm. that's just a large population of people that need help. What have you seen with the opiate epidemic? Have yeah. you seen that make any impact? In we do. Um, um, luckily, we, we kind of find people um, when they've gone through treatment, um, because if, if you're knee-deep in that, um, you're not really looking for a job. Uh, so we find people that come out of treatment and, uh, and we, as long as they stay on that treatment, we, we find success. Okay. All right, so what challenges have you had in finding staff and their expertise for your organization? I think a lot of people may look at Goodwill and say, well, they, they are going to just run a store, but right. that's not what you're right. doing. Yeah, we hired, we hired 39 registered nurses last year. Amazing. And, uh, um, you know, if you talk to any hospital administrator, they're like, wow, how did you do that? You know, <laughs> um, but think about the mission, right? And, right. The, and, and what um, this registered nurse is connected to 25 um, families and you get this long-term relationship, you mm -hmm. put your arm around them, help them on a variety of things. I would besides, love to do that. I know, doesn't it sound like a, <laughs> an awesome job? So, uh, you know, we have to work hard to find them, but when we find them, we keep them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got uh, some 270 teachers on staff, and same thing. Schools are having a hard time finding teachers, but uh, in in our Excel centers, these are adults. These are people that have chosen to come back they and get their education. They want to learn. They want it to go quickly, uh, mm -hmm. so they're attentive, and they come to us at all different levels. So. Um, 
uh, you know, it's not an easy job, but no. the reward is, is incredible. You, you must to, pay equitably to the public school systems. We do. We do. Uh, we, we measure all of that. So across, across the board, um, you know, what a public school system, um, we will look to match that. From a, a registered nurse, we will look to match that. So, mm -hmm. if you want to find quality people, you have to pay you, them. You've got to pay them equitably, and it's just, mm -hmm. just the same with, um, you know, a store manager or a district manager or senior leadership of the organization. Um, we do comparisons across multiple disciplines to make sure we can find quality people. That's true. You know, so, a district manager for retail stores. So, mm -hmm. whether you know you are. Um, Managing you know, ten dollar generals or ten goodwills, you have a lot of the same um, the same opportunities and issues and expectations uh, that those would have. It's just mm -hmm. like you know, myself or my senior staff. You know, um, forty one hundred employees, one hundred and eight sites across thirty nine counties. Um, you know, we run a school system, fifteen mm -hmm. high schools, mm -hmm. we have seventy five retail stores. We've got this health component where we've got, um, you know, HIPAA rules to abide by in the schools. We have FERPA rules to abide uh, abide mm -hmm. by. There's there's it's pretty complex when you think about it. And I've got to find the best people to make sure our people, the people we serve, the people we employ, um, um, you know, are held up to the best standard. And that's so that's important. Right. And I hear that when you do go to employ them, not only do you want to pay them equitably for what they could do in mm -hmm. the rest of the market, but you also are looking for somebody with a passion for your goals. Yes. Yeah. So this is, um, I, I stole from my predecessor this kind of thought, and that, and, and that um, is that we hire, um, we hire for empathy, for one thing, but mm -hmm. we also, um, we look for somebody that has a, a good business mind, Right there's so much at stake. Mm -hmm. Lives are at stake, mm -hmm. so you got to have a good business mind that can steer the ship in the right direction and mm -hmm. grow and lead. Because the more you grow, the more you can serve. But also, you got to have a heart for the mm -hmm. mission. You got to right. understand that. And sometimes that's not the easiest to find is somebody right. that because lots of people are driven. Right mm -hmm. there's good business. Right. You the know, transformational leadership is what you're looking yes. for, and they do not come inexpensively. They don't because they're they're sought for by everyone. They are. Ev the, what, what I just described mm -hmm. is what we, you know, from a nonprofit perspective, what we need. Mm -hmm. But any place I've ever worked, look for people that succeed mm -hmm. are those people that understand mm -hmm. both. Have the right? empathy. Interesting. So um, those challenges they've not changed over time. Just trying to find the right people and you know it's uh, it's just different you know um, uh, depending on the economy mm -hmm. who knocks on your door is 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 mm -hmm. different um, you know we are you know we are from the aspect of using technology with um, you know the, the different websites and that type of thing changes on where we find people but oh. um, you know the actual folks we look for hasn't changed. I see. I see. So when I donate um, a shirt and a dress and a bicycle to Goodwill, mm -hmm. it goes into the store. It, how does that turn into resources? Do you, yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. How does that pay you and pay the man at the store and 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 still have some for the community. How does that work? Yeah. So, um, you know, um, the good Reverend Helms. Yes. Um, kind of, you know, through this um, young lady that raised her hand, kind of created this business model. And uh, it's become really complex over the years. It's not in... Um, it's not in the basement of churches anymore. Right. These are, you know, we are... Uh, out looking for you know uh, prominent retail sites and, and everything. So mm -hmm. that shirt and the bike and, and whatnot. That's uh, we've got to process that. So we've got, believe it or not, we have engineers that set up our back rooms mm. to make sure we're as efficient as possible. We have a point of sale system. We have to have 
um, um, you know, um, fixtures within the store and lighting and, and make it as appealing as possible because the more appealing and the more real it looks like a regular retail environment, the more people that will come, mm -hmm. the more people that will donate. Mm -hmm. And so it's all about transformation of those goods um, um, and monetizing those goods so that we can pay the people doing the processing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, and uh, what's left over is, you know, covers overhead, but it also covers investment into um, mission programs. So we look at the people inside the store as we're serving those people, providing mm -hmm. them opportunities and trying to lift them up. But also what's left over, we invest in um, all these other programs mm -hmm. um, I've talked about as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about a $160 million budget for our Goodwill, as I said, mm -hmm. in those 108 sites, 39 counties, 4,100 employees. Right. It's about 160 million. About 100 million is retail generated um, revenue, um, and uh, about 30 million is through um, our education and health uh, programs and these federal and state funding. So mm -hmm. it's it's pretty complex when you look at mm -hmm. uh, um, how all the revenue kind of comes in and how it kind of disperses out. Yeah. So how has that changed? So, uh, are, excuse me, but are you for profit or not we for profit? We are non -pro not for you profit. You are not for profit. Right. Okay. So, so how... That is our tax status and okay. that, and just kind of explain that. So, uh, you know, we don't have shareholders. We, we don't pay dividends, all that. The money that's left over is, is sunk right back. Um, into the mission. So there's not an ownership. It's a volunteer board of directors that hire oh, me. I see. Uh, and these are community leaders um, from across oh. uh, our area. And they are, that's their charge is to uh, make sure they hire the right chief executive. Sure. And then make sure that I'm, um, you know, being the best steward that I can be with, with the organization. And um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it is a board of directors that I report mm -hmm. to. It's just mm -hmm. not a for-profit. So how um, has that changed over time? Has that grown? Has that... You know, the uh, since the complexity of the organization has grown, we've added um, uh, entities. So the education uh, has its own separate uh, board of directors. We have nine oh. uh, individuals that are on the Goodwill Education Initiatives Board. For this goodwill. Um, for this goodwill. Okay. So the, and those are, um, you know, it's it's a school board. They have sure. 15 schools, and there's a lot of regulations and, and standards that they have to adhere to. Mm -hmm. And and uh, you know, I'm the president of that uh, organization as well. And um, um, we have a foundation, which is our investment or our uh, philanthropy arm of goodwill, and that has its own separate. Uh, board of directors because even though we have this wonderful uh, financial engine in the retail it's it's just not enough to, to serve as many people and do as do as much as we want to so we have this philanthropy and that's a separate entity which helps support goodwill uh, and then we have the operating board but it's uh, to find individuals that understand the complexity of the organization to uh, make sure that uh, your board is as diverse as possible, mm -hmm. right? That, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, those are all things that we strive to do and that those, you know, that's changed over the years from you know, just having one board to multiple mm -hmm. boards and, and the complexities that are entailed in those boards. So you're sort of president over the nursing stuff, over the school, over the philanthropy, and over the 106, no, over the, how many, how many, how many stores in our area? Uh, 70, 74 stores 74 in our area. Stores. Yes. Yeah. That's a big <laughs> load of responsibility. Yeah, it is. And uh, uh, I love every minute of it. Uh, it is challenging. And, uh, um, you know, um, within um, our goodwill, so out of the 160, we are the fourth largest. So I'm oh. proud of that in the fact that not that um, you know, um, you, you, it's not necessarily what you strive for, mm -hmm. um, but we also, so fourth largest means we serve a lot of people. Right. Uh, from the number of employees that are employed within the organization, we are second largest. And that's uh, uh, 
goodwill of Milwaukee and Chicago, it's all combined. They, they're the largest mm, um, makes employer. So uh, from a diversity standpoint and really helping uh, individuals, I feel really good about our organization. And um, you know, seeing somebody walk across that stage mm -hmm. at the age of 42 with their mm -hmm. mom and grandma in the audience all excited, right. or seeing that the infant mortality rates are going down uh, in the areas that are being served through right. Nurse Family Partnership, mm -hmm. or seeing that individual uh, get their welding certification and go from taking donations, um, you know, at 10 bucks an hour to making $17 an hour as a welder, um, all of those um, make it worth it. How is your organization impacted by local, state, and federal regulations? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, Donation laws have changed over the years. Uh, a couple of examples. So these are regulations that have changed that have impacted us. Mm. So the most recent change where the standard deduction went up to 24,000. Mm -hmm. um, we thought it would really impact our donations from a uh, goods and clothing, the blouse and right that, mm -hmm. you know, um, so that we haven't seen the significant change there yet. Oh, good. But in automobiles, so we have an automobile um, program where we take automobiles and um, auction those off and then invest that money into mission programs. Interesting. That's, that's taken a significant hit over um, the last couple of years. Um, you know, uh, there's been tax law changes on from a, um, a property tax mm -hmm. where used to be we had, uh, like a church, we would mm -hmm. receive um, uh, property tax uh, abatement Mm -hmm. um, for sites, even where we leased sites, and that's changed. There was a, mm -hmm. a tax law change about 10 years ago where uh, we don't get that uh, rebate anymore. Or mm -hmm. that, um, so that's, that's been difficult. Um, but overall, just as things change, we work hard to adjust um, to those changes. So from a regulation standpoint, um, uh, if if there's a focus, like right now, the governor of Indiana has a focus on infant mortality. Mm -hmm. uh, Indiana ranks seventh worst in Does. the nation Does. for babies that die before their first birth. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Indiana, it's about 7.4 out of every thousand births. Mm -hmm. If you're African American, it's close to 15. So it's just atrocious. So I'm very glad that the governor is focused on that. That's where we get our money, some of our money to implement the Nurse Family Partnership Program. So the state, and then there's also federal focus on this. Mm -hmm. So we bring that money together and we're able to hire nurses and that type of thing. So, um, you know, from a regu regulatory standpoint with him and then other key legislators getting behind mm -hmm. um, that as a metric that, that we're not proud of, right. we get funding so that we're able to operate mm -hmm. um, our programs. It sounds like you're very data driven. We are. Yes. Do you yeah. just just look at yeah. the numbers in every which way? We do. So, uh, you know, an example of why we have to be data driven, besides I just think it's good practice, mm -hmm. um, is the, the state of Indiana um, provides us funding to run the Excel centers. And we get money per, per pupil or per seat yes. that is filled, ADM count. Right. So we get money per seat. Um, and we have to be good stewards of that. So they measure us on the number of graduates, how many, how many individuals graduate with a dual credit and or um, certification, mm -hmm. uh, industry-recognized certification. And then we have to follow them hmm. and measure their income post-graduation, okay. six yeah. months, a year so we keep, we keep track of of all that stuff so you know I know that um, right now 97 percent of our graduates uh, this past year have a either college dual credit or industry recognized certification I know that 38 uh, percent have gone on to Ivy Tech and the persistency rate which means that um, uh, how many of those that went in are either still in or have graduated? Our persistency rate is 76%. So, Amazing. So that's, I can sit down with legislators. I have, I'm a, a registered lobbyist. Mm -hmm. It's required um, because how much time I spend at the state house. Um, 
uh, I can sit down with legislators and give them that data and show them the research that University of Notre Dame, Ball State, Dr. Hicks did, mm -hmm. yes. um, and uh, uh, IU, the um, Center for Evaluation and Education Policy. We've got to have all that so that we can continue Impressive. to get the funding. So yeah, we are. Wow. <laughs> every program is very similar wow. in knowing the data um, behind that. So do you have any connections outside of what we've talked about to faith communities in the, in the areas? So the, our connection um, uh, with faith is um, a lot of our referrals into Nurse Family Partnership, um, the Excel Center, employment, recidivism programming, uh, disability refer. A lot of our referrals are generated um, you know, through the various um, churches and, and faith-based community. So that's, um, we're very well connected. Excellent. Right? So how can I, just as a local community member, help you on your mission? So continue donating that blouse, that buy, <laughs> and anything else that you have. That is, right. and, and you know, um, I tell everybody this, because not everybody understands the story of Goodwill and the complexity and what our mission is. And, and sometimes we get people um, uh, who say things about us. They just don't yes. understand, you know, the organization. So uh, anything you can do to help spread that message. Good that, PR. That, yes, good PR is always, always helpful. Uh, when those negative, uh, uh, you know, uh, Facebook blasts yes. come, which happen, right? They do. And, and it, not they just do. us, it, it, mm -hmm. other really good mm -hmm. quality um, organizations are impacted by that. Mm -hmm. uh, I love it when I see people get on there and say, you know what, I, I, know, I know them. I've I seen them. this. The, I have done that. Yeah. I have done that. And anybody that, if you come across one of those folks, mm -hmm. I would love to give them a tour and show them mm -hmm. what's, what's happening. Well, I will keep your, keep your um, contact information okay. close. So do you have anything else that you want to add today? No, you know, i uh, um, just excited to sit here and tell our story and, and, and glad that there's people going to hear it. There will. Mm -hmm. We will have a, a, we'll spread it as far as we yeah. can. All right. Thank you very much, All Kent right. Kramer, Thank you. for spending the morning with us and uh, continue on your good works. All right. Thank you. Thank you.